good stuff. Hey, we're gonna get into God's word here. Exodus chapter 34 is where we're at for our main text here. And let me kind of give you a little context of what's happening surrounding this moment. There's, there's a group of people, a nation of people that God has called out as his own. They're called the people of Israel or the Israelites. And God has brought them out of slavery. They were enslaved to another nation and they brought them out. God brought them out of slavery in Egypt and he's now taking them through this period of refinement. It's referred to as a desert season in the Bible here. And, and he's refining them, getting them to be the kind of people that are ready to follow him. One of the things that he's doing is he's setting up some laws. There was no government for this nation. They were brand new. They had just kind of been born uh, into the world. And now they're got to kind of get a framework. And so God gives them these 10 laws. We know them as the 10 commandments. Moses comes down the mountain with these tablets of stone that have been drawn on by God's finger. It says the finger of God inscribed these. I mean, it's, it's a powerful moment. He comes down to find the people worshiping an idol. They were actually bowing down before a golden calf, and they were actually saying that this is the God that delivered them from Egypt. That this golden calf, this idol, this image was actually the thing that had brought them out. And, and on the Ten Commandments, one of them says, don't have any other gods before me. Moses gets frustrated. He throws and breaks things that God had made. and He gets the people right. He burns the calf down, just gets everybody in the right spot. And then he's like, I got to go and report this to the big man, you know. So he goes back up the mountain and we see this in Exodus chapter 34, that he's about to have this encounter with God. And it says this, so Exodus 34, verse four. So Moses chiseled out two stone tab tablets like the first ones. So he went back up there with these blank tablets. You know, he, he had come down with something. He's like, hey, uh, could, you, could you do it again for me? You know, and, and he went up on Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone, stone tablets in his hands. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and he proclaimed his name, the Lord. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. We've entitled this message, Choosing Forgiveness. Choosing Forgiveness. Now, if you look at this passage with us, we see that God's kind of giving his LinkedIn profile out loud, okay? Yeah. He's kind of reading how he does business. He does business by by not getting angry, slow to anger, he's abounding in love, he's gracious and compassionate, and then it says that he's forgiving of wickedness, sin, and rebellion. Now, what I wanna, what I wanna share with you here, kind of launch into this message about forgiveness, is that many times when we think of forgiveness, we think of us coming to God to receive forgiveness for our sins. And so that's what's happening here. The, the people had sinned greatly and God basically is saying, hey, hey, I know what's happened and this is how I do business. So you can come back to me. We're gonna, we're gonna restore this relationship. I'm gonna forgive you. And that's, that's great because we need to be rest assured today that wherever we are in our lives, that we can receive forgiveness for our sins. There's nobody who's done anything that's too far that's outside of God's reach today. You're here and you're, God's grace is available for you and you can reach out and receive that for your own lives. But what I also kind of want to bring out as a kind of an obvious thing in the story, but it's almost something that you overlook is this idea that God was bringing up the fact that they had done something wrong. <laughs> for, for you to have forgiveness, you first of all have to have an offense to forgive. Amen. And so forgiveness is an option only if there has first been an offense. And so that's something we need to remember when we come before the Lord, if there is an offense, that we go to him in humility 
and asking for forgiveness. And so we're gonna dig deeper into this idea of choosing forgiveness, and now we're gonna kind of flip the script because we sometimes, we can easily receive that forgiveness from God, but here's, there's, there's this gap that happens between forgiveness from person to person. And so we're gonna look at that today and what that looks like in choosing forgiveness when it happens horizontally. And so it's, it's not the easiest thing when we've been offended to forgive someone who's hurt us, who's wounded us. In fact, a, a couple of years ago, we were putting the kids to bed and I remember Jeremiah was putting Kai to bed and something happened, you know, an accident. He accidentally stepped on his like little toe or something. Kai is just screaming, crying. Jeremiah's like, I'm sorry, forgive me. And so I'm just watching this whole thing go down and Kai's just got all the tears because that's what six-year-olds do, you know. They just flop all around and... Every, it's the end of the world. And so he's crying and Jeremiah's like, sorry, will you forgive me? And I remember through his tears, through his pain, he wraps his arms around Jeremiah and he goes, I forgive you. <laughs> and I remember learning two things in that moment. Number one, I was so proud of Kai to forgive someone who hurt him even though he was still hurting. And um, number two, I could relate to that. Because there have been times where people have hurt me and I've struggled with forgiving them because it still hurt. And that's the thing about forgiveness. It's, it's, forgiveness is not a feeling, it's a promise. Mm -hmm. Meaning I'm not always going to feel like forgiving the person who has offended me, but I am choosing to forgive them and choosing not to bring it up again. And that's what forgiveness is. And so today I wanna pass it to Pastor Maurice and Sharon. Have you guys ever struggled with forgiveness? Yes. <laughs> um, so what I wanna start off sharing with you guys, I just want you to know that my husband and I have shared this story before with other people and he's okay with us sharing it today. So in April of 97, we moved to Bolingbrook in what the Lord blessed us to be a newly constructed home. In December of 1997, my husband told me that adultery had entered into our marriage. And so when he told me that, I went over to him and I hugged him. Mm. Because I knew, I just, I, I could feel his sadness in even having to share that with me. And I knew that there was something going on in him for that to even have occurred. And so after further discussion, I found out that the person that he committed adultery with was someone that I knew. Mm. All three of us worked for the same company. Mm. The two of them worked at a location on the south side of Chicago, and I worked at the main location in downtown Chicago. So we would go to after work events together. This person had been to our home for dinner. Mm. I had given her clothes. I had given her a fur coat. I mean, she was a single mom, and so I, you know, I, I had compassion for her. And so I asked my husband, you know, well, do you want to get a divorce? He said yes. Mm. So in January of 98, our brand new home was on the market. Mm. A few months later, in April, I was served with divorce papers. Now, my husband had never moved out of the home. He just wasn't staying there. And so um, things kind of went dormant. There was no activity, you know, for quite a few months. And I had basically moved on because I felt like, well, he wants a divorce. I've been served, so I'm just going to go on. And, you know, I had people saying to me, well, yeah, you deserve to be happy, too. And I bought into that. And so... Um, I came home one day, and his car was in the garage. And like I said, I had moved on, so I'm kind of like, well, what is he doing here? And so when I came in the house, he said that he had went to God, and he had asked God for forgiveness. He asked me to forgive him. And he said that he, if I was willing, that he wanted to work on our marriage. Now, during this whole time, you know, when I first found out, I said to the Lord, I said, God, if you're going to get the glory out of this, then I'm willing to go through it. And so during that time, um, I found out that he was 
going to the same church that this young lady was going to. Um, her parents went to that church. Her grandmother went to that church. Her uncle and his wife and their children went to that church. Her siblings went to that church. But I had talked to the pastor of that church during the time that we were going through, and he prayed for me. And so I thought, well, I wanted to go and meet him and, and give this church an opportunity. And so um, before the Sunday before I went, the young lady called me, and she apologized. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, I forgave you a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And then I prayed for her, mm -hmm. and then she cried. So that Sunday when we were going, getting ready for church, I had to go to the church alone because my husband had to be there earlier because he had some duties there. And so I drove to the church by myself and unbeknownst to me on that day, they were having men and women's day. Now, for those of us who grew up in a Baptist congregation with black folk, we know what men and women's day is. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, it's basically just two services, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And it's a way to, to raise money and to you know have male and female speakers come in and uh, minister to us. And so for this particular one, they were having a male and a female for men and women's day to do what they call conducting the service, which is basically like the worship leader. We had an order of service and they would say, okay, choir, so-and-so, so-and-so is gonna come up and they're gonna give an A and B selection. Y'all know about that. <laughs> and so um, when I, so I'm sitting there in a the congregation and my husband's in the pulpit and I'm like, okay, that's fine, normal, cause you know, he's, he's a minister. But this young lady was in the pulpit too. And she ain't no minister. And so what is she doing up there? So when the service started, and they called up the people to come and conduct the service, she and my husband stepped forward. They were the two people that they had selected to do the, uh, be the conductors. So when I saw her standing there next to him, I was feeling some kind of way. And I realized, no, Sharon, you did not forgive her a long time ago. And so I realized then, in the same way that I was able to forgive my husband, God wanted me to forgive her. Wow. And so that's where the struggle began. And in time, I was able to forgive her. And I knew the moment when I was able to forgive her because I no longer felt some kind of way when I saw her. Mm. Instead, I felt sorry for her. I felt compassion for her. I felt a sadness for her because I knew some things about, some things that had happened to her. And so that's when I knew that I had really, truly forgiven her. Wow. Hmm. Amen. <laughs> so now you all know just a little bit about the history of uh, how we came to be and how Covenant Keepers Marriage Ministry was birthed. I hurt my wife deeply at that moment, and I want you to know that even a man of the cloth, a preacher, God sent. The devil can even try to fool God's elect. That's right. And here I am in the pulpit ministering to those in the church, but yet here I am now caught in the act of adultery. But God is a gracious and forgiving God, Amen. and that's what this whole therapy is about. As Christians, we are called to be like Jesus, yeah. forgiving something that seems unforgivable mm. when you have justification or reason not to. To help us with this, Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13 tells us, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Mm. Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So that was the charge to me. I experienced God's kind of love 
by my wife wrapping her arms around me and forgiving me and was willing to fight to redeem our marriage. Bible says if you're caught in the act of adultery, you have grounds to no longer be married. So my wife gave me what God gives us every day, forgiveness. Yes. Totally and completely. We are never more like Jesus than when we are forgiving. That's good. That's good. The Lord calls for us to give, to forgive even when it hurts, even when we don't understand, even when we feel that we are justified and we have a right. God forgave us while we were yet sinners. Yes. The evidence of God's work in our lives is when someone hurts us, accuses us of something we didn't do, blames us, and yet we can find in our hearts to forgive them. We have the highest bar set for anyone that's set for a believer. We don't have an out. We don't have an excuse. We have to forgive because we have been forgiven. Yes. That's hard, y'all. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's very hard. When you've been hurt, when you're angry, mm -hmm. when you've been falsely accused, your natural inclination and instinct, your emotions mm -hmm. are to feel that I'm justified, I have a right, mm -hmm. I don't have any self-control at this point, I want to get even. Mm -hmm. But yet God says, forgive mm -hmm. that you might be forgiven. Yes. As hard as it is, God presents a way for us to be whole again. Mm. And that is through the gift of forgiveness. Mm. Forgiveness is, is, is not uh, us ignoring the wrong that someone has done to us. That's right. Right. Yes. Forgiveness is not us acting as though it didn't happen. It's not ignoring the sin. Right. Mm. We have to call it what it is. It's sin. God hates sin and does not ignore it, and neither should God's people. Yes. Mm. What's wrong is wrong, and what's right is right. God does not overlook our sin, and we should neither. Mm. He tells us in Luke 17 and 3, so watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Mm. If he repents, mm. forgive him. So forgiveness is not our uh, putting a person on probation. In other words, we are going to take an opportunity to put this person on trial. And we're going to wait over a period of time and see if we can find it in our hearts to forgive the offense. Forgiveness says regardless of how I feel, regardless of what I think they did to me, I'm going to forgive because he first forgave me. That's, good. Amen. Mm. That's the lens that we look through. We look through that lens that as Jesus has forgiven me, I can forgive others. That's so good. You know what I've learned, and I'm, I'm glad you clarified the difference between what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not so that we can continue to grow. I believe that we all have room to grow in the area of forgiveness. I find that even as I get older, it's a little bit easier, I put that in quotation, I say that very lightly, it's easier to forgive. Why? Because every single day I know how much I need to be forgiven. And so when I walk through that knowledge, it's a little bit easier to forgive those who have offended me. But I've learned that forgiveness, it's not an automatic. It's this maturing process, but we have to get it from God. We have to go to God so that he can increase our capacity. And so we need to go to greater levels concerning forgiveness, mm. this characteristic. So can you guys help us uh, grow in this area? What are some ways that we can get to greater levels in the area of forgiveness? Well, I think that um, perhaps we can better tell what forgiveness is by observing what it does when God forgives. Yeah. You see, when God forgives, he removes the notation of the wrong from his record. Forgiveness is more than refusing to give blow by blow or uh, an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth because we can refrain from doing those things and still harbor 
ill will and bitterness in our hearts. And so um, Acts 3.19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. When God forgives, he forgets the wrong done. Hebrews 8.12 says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Amen. Now that's a promise. Yes. We know that God is omniscient and we know that he knows all things. When God forgives though, I just wanna do a little sharingology. Um, I don't think it means that he just has amnesia, right. that he just wipes everything out mm. and pretends that it didn't happen. I think what it means is that he's not going to use that to condemn us. He's not going to use it to destroy us for it to be to our destruction. And he's not going to use it. He's not going to remind us of it. He's not going to throw it back up in our faces. Because through Jesus Christ, what he did for us, the price that he paid for our redemption and our salvation, when he did that, he put us back in right standing with God. We were forgiven. Likewise, when we forgive others, then we shouldn't condemn them. Yes. We shouldn't use it for their destruction. We shouldn't use it to throw it back up in their face. The same way that Jesus Christ reconciled us back to God and put us right back in right standing as if we had never sinned. When we forgive others, then we do the same for them. We put them right back in right standing with us as if they never, ever offended us. And so um, sometimes people may say, well, I'll forgive you but I'll never forget. That's not forgiveness. Because if you're going to keep a record of it, that's saying that you have some ill will and some bitterness still in your heart. Now, we say, I'll never forget. And God says, I'll remember it no more. Now, they sound similar, but it's not the same. Because if I say I will never forget, that's a matter of what some negative stuff that's going on in my heart. But when God says, I will remember it no more, that's a reflection of what's going on in his heart. And so the goal is in forgiveness is for our hearts to line up with his heart. Because as we've said, forgiveness is a promise. It's not based on our perception or our point of view. Okay, so what I'm doing right now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm just on the therapy couch right here, okay? <laughs> I'm just taking this in. Do you, you understand, someone who's had a, a very, very wrong thing happen to them, Sharon here, and she's saying, now I've taken what God has done for me, and now I'm applying it to the way that I treat others. That is like literally exactly what we're supposed to do all the time. We're not just supposed to ask, what would Jesus do? We're supposed to ask, what did Jesus do? Yes, now. And now do the exact thing that he did. Yes. And what's powerful about this is that you're saying that this is the way that I've lived my life. I've not, I've not brought it up to him and thrown it back in his face. Face. And I want you guys to hear this because I know y'all looking like, oh man, that must have been hard. But you're like, I can't do that. You ever, you ever heard somebody say, oh, I can't do that. Listen, the Holy Spirit empowers us yes. to be able to do it. Yes. So you guys have just been so good so far. Can you just take us a little bit deeper into this? Like, kind of give us some benefits or, or the why of why we should go be, forgive. Like, what, what does forgiveness give to us and why should we do it? That's a good question, Pastor Jeremiah. And I know many of you all sitting out there saying, wow, that, that, that was an ugly thing you did, man. You uh, built a brand new house. You ain't even in it a year. Uh, you're supposed to be serving other folk, and here you are caught in adultery, and you go back and you tell this beautiful woman that uh, you don't want to be with her no more, and you hurt her deeply, and now the house is on the market, and now you got divorce papers. 
uh, all of that, the enemy meant it for evil, but God meant uh, it for uh, good. Yes, Amen. Yes. Uh, that was a God moment. We think we know God, but until we really experience him, we really don't. My wife showed me God's kind of love. And as a result of that, many of you know about Covenant Keepers Marriage Ministry. That's how it was birthed. She had her out. She had the right. She was justified according to scripture. Wasn't caught in the act. I told her. And the evidence was very present. But she decided to forgive me. So the question that Pastor Jeremiah asked, is there anything that we can do to, to understand this better and why we should do this? If I could sum it up in one word, Pastor Jeremiah, it would be the word hope. Hope. We should forgive because it creates hope. Mm. Hope that reconciliation is possible. Yes. Ah. Hope for the future, that there will be a future. Yes. Hope for a healthy, a vibrant, and thriving relationship. You can get past this. Yes. Yes, you can. Hope gives a sense of certainty, trust, and a confident of ex, uh, of, of confident expectation. You can expect something because of hope. Mm. Without hope, and if you withhold gift forgiveness, it keeps emotions and hurt and anger alive. Yeah. It causes darkness to begin to perpetuate in your life. Mm. Forgiveness liberates the soul ah, yes. it removes the fear yes. and that is why it is such a powerful weapon ah, it's a weapon mm. forgiveness is a gift from god just as unforgiveness is a gift from the devil mm. we need to understand and know the difference yes. the past is the past and we look to the future with hope yes. so we want to use Today, you can take notes here. The acoustic hope, H-O-P-E. H meaning healing. Hope brings healing. So many relationships in because they seem to think and believe there is no way out and there is no hope. Hmm. I thought that way when I had done what I did. I figured she would say, okay, I'm going to sign the papers, get out. Move on, it's done. But God said, not yet. Forgiveness restores hope for a future and for that relationship. We're sitting here 31 years. We celebrated 31 years on the 1st of July. Ah, God did get that. Never thought I'd see that. Without forgiveness, one becomes hopeless. Forgiveness brings the one thing that all of us need when we're hurt. When we're blamed unjustly, when we're angry, we need healing mm. for our relationship yes. and for us. Ephesians 4.32, and many of the covenant ministry class knows that this is the scripture we're now studying. He says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. As a believer, we don't have an excuse. God forgave it all. Amen. All to him we owe. Yes. Sin had left a crimson stain, and the Lord washed us white as snow. Yes. The O is for opportunity. Mm. Forgiveness strengthens your ministry, it strengthens your relationship, and it strengthens you. Yes. God has called each one of us to do good works. To make a difference in the world for him. Mm. It's not about us, but it's all about him. Amen. When we harbor bitterness in our hearts, we can never make a difference for God. Wow. Mm. And we won't make a difference. Mm. God intended for us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Yes. When we came to Living Water, it was a year before we served in ministry. Because prior to us coming to Living Water, we were hurt at our former church. And we realized hurting people hurt others. 
And we needed to have forgiveness to take place in our lives and for us to be healed before we could go about ministering to others. So forgiveness requires that you get what is necessary for your heart to be right, for you to have right fellowship and relationship with God, and that you're thereby then able to give others what God has given unto you. Amen. Ephesians 2 and 10 tells us, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God didn't just save us to be saved. He saved us so that whatever God gives us, we can give back to others. Forgiveness is what we give out because it's what God gave us. Ah. He redeemed us. He washed us. He gave us another opportunity. And so this is our passion. This is our life. This is what we do. We know no matter what it is, you can forgive. Because it ain't in you, it's in God. All right. Mm. Amen. I'm going to so, shut you down, man. This is good stuff right <laughs> now, you know, my husband said, uh, when he talks about the church hurt, that's a totally different yeah, we, story yeah. for uh, mm. another day. Mm. But I was really hurt when we came to Living Water. And um, as my husband said, we had to sit and allow God to heal us because hurting people do hurt others. But the flip side of that is that healed people yes. heal others. Come on. Yes. Yes. So when God healed us, then we were, we're now able to heal other people. And so um, I'm going to pick it up with the P is personal. Yeah. Because, see, forgiveness does more for us than it does for the person that we're forgiven. That's right. It even helps our physical bodies Amen. when we forgive. The Mayo Clinic says that when we forgive other people, it lowers our blood pressure. They said that when we forgive other people, it promotes a strong immune system. That's the physical part. And then even emotionally it helps us. You know, sometimes we may suffer with uh, anxiety or, or sadness and even depression at times. Some of that is emotional and some of it is clinical. But when we forgive others, it actually releases some things that give us inner healing. And so um, I want to do the E, echo. Yes. Hmm. Lastly, and most importantly, we forgive because as we've all said before, we have been forgiven. Amen. That's the most important reason. And so because Christ forgave us, we should echo that same characteristic. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Amen. But... Mm. If you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. You will find it easier to forgive when you consider how much you have been forgiven. Amen. Forgiveness removes barriers that without forgiving will not be removed. You know, we had barriers. If, if forgiveness hadn't taken place, those barriers would still be there today. Wow. Then they're just not going to move themselves. We have to do something. And so as you take steps to restore peace in your heart, <laughs> you will feel a shift. Yes. Every act of forgiveness is an act of healing your own self. And as you take these steps to forgive, you take the power back that you allowed unforgiveness to have over you. As you practice forgiveness on a regular basis, you feel lighter as you expand your capacity for flexibility, love, and compassion, both to give to others and to receive yourself. Amen. Amen. Sister Sharon, I, I believe that the, the spirit behind it is the willingness, the willingness to say, God, I, I want you to give me the capacity to forgive 
in the, in the capacity you've forgiven me. And that's what I see in you. That's what I see in your marriage. And I believe all of us can have that today because there may be some of us today that might be harboring unforgiveness in our hearts. And it's one of the most poisonous things. Even something Pastor Maurice said, he said, forgiveness is a gift from God and unforgiveness is a gift from the enemy. And I, I've never heard it that way before, but I, I don't want any gifts from the enemy. Ah. I don't want to receive anything he has mm -mm. to offer. Mm -mm. And it's one of his biggest tricks to bind up believers, to keep them trapped and held back. And so I want us right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna search our hearts. It's that, that's important to do, mm. is search your hearts daily before the Lord and look and ask God, is there any unforgiveness that I've not dealt with, that I've not given to you, God? Maybe I felt justified in holding on to it. Because here's, here's the biggest thing, is like they said, it doesn't hurt them, it hurts us. Yes. One of the biggest quotes we've heard is that, Unforgiveness is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. Yes, that's good. But what I find is when I release forgiveness on that person, whether I feel like they deserve it or not, mm. I'm the one who's free. I'm the one who steps out of that prison door and now I'm lighter and I can go living the life that God has called me to. And so we're gonna pray in just a moment and we're gonna ask God to move. And so I want you to go ahead and bow your hearts, bow your, your heads to the Lord right now and right where you're at, Right where you're at, I want you to prep your heart and ask God, God, is there any unforgiveness in my life right now? Is there any unforgiveness? And we're gonna pray that in just a moment. Before we do that, I know that there's some watching online or in this room, and you need to take the first step, which is receive forgiveness. You need to receive forgiveness from your heavenly Father, who is a holy God. And the way that we receive forgiveness is because we have our Savior, Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, who left heaven, came to earth, lived a sinless life, and He willingly, willingly laid down His life so that our sins could be paid for by His death. And today, you can receive that free gift by faith, it's free. You don't have to clean yourself up. You come just as you are.